Welcome to the 2022 Simpson Ramsey Symposium and Glenwood Endowed Lectureship. My name is Sarah O'Kelly. I am a clinical psychologist and associate professor in the departments of psychology and pediatrics at UAB. And I'm also the director of the LEND and USED training programs um, that are, operate within the Civitan Sparks Clinics. We are so excited to welcome everyone to our annual Simpson Ramsey Symposium and so excited to partner with the Glenwood Endowed Lectureship uh, this year. So with that background being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce um, Ken Oliver, who is going to talk about the Glenwood Lectureship as well as introduce our first speaker. It is, it's our honor to be part of this symposium um, and to continue with the Glenwood Lectureship uh, Series, which has been going on now for about 17 years. I'm told that it began in 2005, uh, and we are truly fortunate to be able to be in this collaborative relationship with the UAB School of Public Health. I don't know if Dean Irwin has been able to join us yet. I know he had something earlier this morning, but I definitely want to express our appreciation to the dean and his staff at, at, at the School of Public Health for the relationship that we've developed over the years and look forward to continuing for many more. Um, and we're honored to be part of this symposium, as I said, uh, and especially to be able to help launch it with uh, our, our guest speaker today. Um, Glenwood, I'll take just a minute to put a little plug in for Glenwood. We've been uh, a presence in the Birmingham community since 1974. And uh, we're, we're a multifaceted provider of education, residential training, uh, community services, testing and diagnosis services uh, within the Birmingham community and even throughout the state of Alabama and beyond. Uh, we're fairly well known as a program that uh, specializes in uh, development of, of care uh, programs for people on the autism spectrum, uh, and we're continuing to expand those services throughout, as I said, the greater community of Birmingham and even throughout the state and beyond. In a typical year, we will reach about 8,000 people with our training and education programs, as well as all of the testing and diagnos diagnostic work we do, and then the residential and day programs that we provide. Um, uh, both education for children and then various forms of community day programming for the adults that we serve. So again, we're honored to be part of this um, and uh, we look forward to many years of continuing collaboration with UAB and, and the School of Public Health. Uh, it's also my honor to introduce our speaker today uh, for the uh, Glenwood Endowed Lectureship. Um, a brief look at Dr. Michael uh, Waymire's bio reveals a depth of truly amazing accomplishments. Uh, he's currently the chair of the special ed department at the University of Kansas. He's a distinguished professor and uh, acknowledged as a senior scientist there on that staff. He's authored or co-authored over 460 peer reviewed articles and over 45 books. And uh, one of those books has been mentioned as, as a leading textbook uh, in, in this field of neural development. Uh, he, he really focuses on self-development, self-determination, positive psychology and disability and the transition to adulthood at, through education and inclusion for those people who are experiencing intellectual challenges. Um, the, the depth of his background goes all the way back to uh, his time in, he, he, he has a bachelor's degree in special ed and a master's in special ed, and then took his PhD at, those are from the University of Tulsa, then he took his PhD at uh, University of Texas in Dallas, and I, in a conversation with him recently, I learned that he actually taught school for a while, and at one point in his career, probably while he was a student, maybe, he worked uh, in a facility and program similar to those that we're all familiar with, delivering care and providing care for people with intellectual disability. So he, he has both a, a, an academic interest and a personal interest and personal history 
in this field that we're all so familiar with. Uh, so it's an honor to have him here as our guest speaker. I asked him about his passion, uh, and he said to help people live self-determined lives. Uh, and I might add that's sort of like all the rest of us. Uh, he, his career has been devoted to helping lead the way for people with intellectual challenges to lead self-development lives, to have dignity in their life, and to live life to its fullest extent uh, for them. Uh, as I said, he, he, he took his education uh, at Tulsa and Dallas. Um, he teaches, researches, lectures, and writes uh, on this subject very widely. I think he promotes dignity and diversity and inclusion in everything that he does. He might also be known as a bit of a gambler. I asked him about the recent March Madness and whether he had a bracket. And he said, yes, he had picked Kansas Jayhawks to go all the way. And I congratulated him on that, on that great win. And he said, well, I picked them every year. So this year, the team finally came through for him. And I, don't, I didn't ask him if he won any money. I don't, don't go into those sort of personal habits of people. But uh, it's rewarding to know that he's also a participant in the March Madness bracketology that we've all become accustomed to in the last several years. So uh, without any further uh, discussion, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Michael Weimeyer for our lecture. Thank you, Ken. Uh, very grateful for that generous uh, introduction. Let me uh, share my slide here. So it, it really is a, a, a privilege to uh, be able to deliver the, the Glenwood Endowed Lecture as part of the, uh, the, the Ramsey Simpson uh, or Simpson Ramsey um, uh, uh, symposium. Um, as Sarah mentioned, <laughs> we were we were supposed to do this two years ago, and then something happened, and uh, many of us have been stranded and grounded. And uh, I know many people have experienced untold losses of different things. So I'm glad to be with you, even if it's virtually today. And um, uh, so. Um, I want to talk about uh, these issues of uh, dignity uh, that Ken uh, mentioned, the role of self-determination and strengths-based approach. Um, I do want to uh, extend my uh, thanks to, to Sarah O'Kelly and to uh, Christina Ford and to Julie McDougall uh, at UAB for uh, their supports of, as we uh, scheduled this and uh, uh, unscheduled it and uh, rescheduled it. Uh, so, and then of course the folks at Glenwood, Ken, Ken Oliver and Linda Baker and the entire planning committee for their work. I, I have uh, uh, done a similar service on uh, uh, other for other organizations and entities on events like this. And I know that it entails a lot of work and a lot of time. So, you know, I also want to take a moment, a moment of personal privilege, if you will, to acknowledge uh, Alan Percy, who I, I know you will be hearing from later. Um, I was a public school teacher, as Ken mentioned, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area from um, basically 1980 to 1987. Uh, and uh, taught adolescents with severe multiple disabilities. Um, and one young woman that uh, was in the class, this was a, a self-contained setting as was the case back in the, in the 80s, um, um, had what uh, eventually became understood to be Rett syndrome. Uh, her parents didn't know uh, what had happened uh, why their daughter had the, 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 the symptoms, the conditions that she had until Dr. Percy's work really illuminated that in the U.S. And, and it was such an, a big thing for them to get that diagnosis and to understand uh, what it was and what they could do. So uh, really, um, uh, you know, I, I'm so uh, humbled by uh, uh, the accomplishments and the impact that uh, Dr. Percy has made. And, and before I launch, uh, 
Uh, my congratulations to the USAID and, and Lynn trainees who are going to be presenting today. And in general, I uh, directed our USAID in Kansas for 15 years, and I know what uh, what in, what important roles that uh, those of you who are in trainee uh, uh, positions right now will play in the in the future. So. Um, with that, let me, I want to, you know, as I near the end of my career, I, uh, I've, I've taken to sort of trying to put together the different strands of my career. It, it, you know, the, it's all focused around issues of self-determination, uh, as, as Ken mentioned, but um, it took me in, in different ways from the history of intellectual and developmental disabilities to issues uh, uh, more specifically around technology use and, and other things. And I tried to weave this for this lecture into sort of a, a narrative, a common narrative. I probably have too many slides and um, <laughs> I, I know I don't want to go into your break. So uh, I'll, I'll try to move through these uh, uh, ex expeditiously. Um, so I, I begin with a, a quote from uh, someone who's a, a self-advocate in the, you know, Kansas City uh, uh, shares a border, uh, both Missouri and, and Kansas, and we're near the Kansas City area. And one of the, the uh, more prevalent and effective uh, self-advocates in the Kansas City area is, is Jean-Paul Bovy. Uh, he has personal experience with autism, and um, he was speaking and talking about issues of self-determination, and, and his definition of self-determination was this. He said, people with autism should be treated with the same dignity, respect, and equality as people without autism. And, you know, I, I think what you'll see as we go through um, uh, my slides and, and uh, through this morning is that these themes of dignity, respect, and equality come up uh, time and time again uh, uh, when people talk about these issues of self-determination. And in fact, um, if you uh, look at the, the gold standard for how we as a society should treat uh, and support people with disability in our society is, I, I think, the Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with disabilities. And Article 3 states the general principle of this international uh, treaty. Um, and uh, and it, it, the very first one, Article 3, you know, uh, Section A, starts off that uh, uh, the overarching general principle for the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability is respect for the inherent dignity, individual autonomy, including the freedom uh, to make one's own choices and independence of persons. Uh, so, you know, Jean-Paul Bovy's uh, uh, ideas about self-determination uh, determination align with these, these broader UN treaty, dignity, autonomy, and choice are central uh, to the lives of people uh, with and without disability. I mean, all of us uh, 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 feel, uh, uh, have these, these basic rights. You know, we, we look at something like uh, the, uh, uh, the convention and, and this article, and, and I, I am certain that everyone in this audience nods your head and says, that's something I, I uh, embrace and I agree with. Uh, but I'm not sure that we really, I mean, we kind of live in a world where we, uh, uh, we embrace that, those ideas and, and work for uh, the dignity of people with disability. But, you know, first of all, the, the, the rest of the world doesn't view disability in that way. And, and we'll talk more about that. But, you know, even, even us, we need to, I think, think what we're saying when we talk about the inherent right or the inherent, the right uh, uh, for inherent dignity and individual autonomy. Inherent means uh, that it's just something that's, that exists within a person. There's, it's inseparable from the person. There's, you know, there's, you know, it, it's just there. And then dignity um, is uh, a state of being worthy or honorable. Uh, 
uh, you know, an elevation of character. When we're talking, uh, uh, you know, it's it's from uh, the Latin root dignus, meaning worthy. So, we're, when we say when when the CRPD says uh, that a basic principle is uh, respect for the inherent dignity of of people with disability, what we're saying is we're claiming that uh, uh, the 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 worth and value of people with disability simply because of their status as a person in, in our society, in our world, uh, just like every other uh, human being. But, you know, I, I, one of the strands of, uh, uh, of work that I've, I've uh, followed uh, through my work is the history of the field. And I think it's fair to say that for most of uh, the time in which dignity has been some, or I'm sorry, disability has been something that that we talk about, uh, um, and and in the U.S. that's roughly the 1830s uh, to the 1850s onward, so approaching on a, you know a couple hundred years. The the status that. Um, better describes the lives over that time is indignity. Um, I had the, the very uh, real privilege of working for a decade at the Ark of the United States. Uh, the Ark is a parent organization or a, an organization uh, that was founded by parents and family members uh, for their sons or daughters with intellectual and uh, as time went on, uh, developmental and, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, uh, I worked for a decade and, and uh, among the people I had the privilege of getting to know were uh, Elizabeth Boggs, one of the founders of uh, the Ark of the United States and a real force. If you have anything to do with the DD Act in the United States, she basically wrote it and got it pushed through. And, and pictured here is Gunnar Dibwad. Dr. Dibwad uh, was not the first, but he was the most influential uh, director of the ARC uh, over time and really pushed the organization toward uh, a focus on community and on uh, uh, full integration. And it, it, his last uh, published piece of work, I think, was in a book that I edited uh, uh, celebrating the now long ago new millennium, <laughs> uh, and he he, 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 uh, he I asked him to write the 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 uh, epilogue for for that book, and he 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 uh, uh, said in this talked about the fact that he uh, quote had a vivid memory of conditions that to most readers will only be historical facts that they have read. He saw firsthand the conditions in overcrowded institutions that originated in, in good intentions uh, intended to give asylum and protection and, and to habilitate, but quickly became warehouses uh, that uh, by the early 20th century uh, served more to protect society supposedly from uh, people with disability than to uh, support people with disabilities. He says, I saw the late 1930s overcrowding and all its dire consequences. The actual Holocaust, uh, Gunner said, uh, story is kept alive because of a strong belief that it is necessary to prevent a repetition in years to come. Likewise, the institutional horrors must be kept alive by eyewitnesses such as in Burton Blatt's Trailblazing Christmas in Purgatory, which he published at great risk uh, to his professional reputation. It must not be forgotten. It cannot be erased from our professional history. When Gunnar Dibwad talks about the Holocaust, this also wasn't just something that he'd read about. He and his family fled Nazi Germany uh, in the 1930s uh, from, uh, from Germany. Uh, and uh, many of his family members uh, did not leave and, and, and were, were uh, murdered. So, you know, he's, he's talking about a time in our history that uh, in which people with disabilities were seen as menaces. Uh, I've done a couple of books uh, looking at and talking about these issues. Um, and uh, they're there if, uh, if you want uh, more information. But I think we as a field have to 
have to uh, understand uh, uh, what uh, is uh, what where where we've been in order to uh, know where we're going to go. A, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, who Hank Bersani, who who passed away a few years ago, um, uh, past president of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, uh, someone whose work pioneered issues of uh, of inclusion and. Uh, and shared with me a, 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 an interest in understanding the history of the field. Um, he, um, he talks about, uh, we, we, we wrote in a chapter and, and looked at the disability movement as comprised of three uh, separate movements. And, and the first one is the professional movement. And, and it, it ran roughly, I think, from 1850 to, to 1950. The photo is of Edward Seguin. Uh, he was a French physician who was uh, really among the first to, uh, to pioneer treatment for people uh, with disability, particularly developmental and neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, he studied under uh, Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard, who, who published The Wild Boy of Aveyron, which was really the first treatment of uh, uh, or, or book looking at uh, treatment of people with disability. Um, uh, Seguin moved to uh, the United States in the 1860s and um, he had his book uh, on uh, these issues translated into English and really became the Bible for what became a, a growing uh, 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 system of institutions that at the very beginning were intended to be habilitative, were intended to provide supports and services to people who, uh, who had up to that point in time uh, had not uh, been part of society who were, who were uh, among the poorest in, our, in, in, in society. Uh, over the course of the the late 19th century, the, this institution movement, the, 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 these institutions founded to, for habilitative purposes grew, the number of them uh, increased. Uh, and by the early 20th century, um, uh, the, the intent had shifted as, as Gunnar Dibwad said, from a, a focus on habilitation and treatment to a focus on if you will, uh, uh, protecting society from people who were deemed to be menaces to society and, uh, and such. Um, and so you saw Wolf Wolfensberger was a, a historian and a, and a, a pioneer. He, for those of you who know the normalization movement, he was one of the pioneers of the normalization movement, which really brought about the much of the, uh, the focus on uh, deinstitutionalization in the United States. Um, and he describes the first uh, decade really, or the, the first half, uh, half century uh, of, uh, of uh, this period as being one of isolation, enlargement and economization, that meaning uh, the, the purposes came to isolate people with disability uh, uh, the, the size of institutions grew uh, uh, much uh, larger than their uh, intention earlier. People were warehoused and eventually uh, the, the scale of these things were more than states were willing to fund. And so you had situations where people basically had to uh, uh, um, work in the institution to earn their keep. We've done some work on, on the, the Calicac family story in which, which was used uh, by eugenicists in the early part of the 20th century to justify uh, forced uh, sterilization of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, segregation and isolation and marriage restriction in a number of ways that were intended to keep people from, from propagating, from, from uh, spreading what was seen to be their disease and their disorder. You know, these institutions, as I said, got large, 
Um, the top photo here is of a man with intellectual disability. This is an institution uh, 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 photo from about the 1930s. Um, hooked up to a wagon in the way that you would hook, hook mules uh, and horses uh, to pull a wagon. And, and uh, the, the, uh, if that's not bad enough, the, the caption talks about how poorly they did this, that these people, these people who are viewed as something less than human is, is almost uh, animalistic in some ways. Uh, were and then you know that uh, that only leads to bad things. Uh, in 1927, the the uh, United States Supreme Court in Buck versus Bell ruled that involuntary and forced sterilization of some people, including people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, was constitutional in the United States. Uh, by uh, the 1970s, when these laws. <clears throat> finally began to be um, repealed and, and uh, 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 overturned uh, something in the neighborhood of 50 to 60,000 Americans with uh, who, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities had been involuntarily sterilized. The photo uh, is of uh, uh, Carrie Buck, uh, who, um, uh, who was the test case uh, in Buck versus Bell and her mother, uh, Emma, uh, both of whom were involuntarily sterilized, forcibly sterilized. Um, and then of course, uh, in Nazi Germany, this was these, these policies, these practices uh, that were uh, generated in the United States were taken to scale uh, something in the neighborhood of 250,000 uh, Germans with disability were involuntarily sterilized. And then at the start of the Holocaust, something in the neighborhood of 80,000 uh, 80, uh, Germans with disabilities were, uh, were murdered in, in gas chambers across Germany. They were seen as, as uh, drains on society, as not fully a person. Gunner mentioned in, in his piece that I read uh, a, a, a a, a really seminal uh, work that was called Christmas in Purgatory by uh, Burton Blatt and Fred Kaplan, uh, Dr. Blatt, uh, uh, who at the time was at Boston University, <clears throat> is in the photo on, uh, on the right. He and, and uh, Fred Kaplan, Fred Kaplan was a, a photographer, toured uh, four uh, or five institutions uh, in 1964 uh, and uh, surreptitiously took photos of the people who were warehoused there um, and um, um, uh, published Christmas in Purgatory that juxtaposed these black and white photos with, uh, um, um, with verses and essays selected by uh, Dr. Blatt. It was sent out to uh, advocates, to parents and family members, um, and um, uh, it really began uh, along with several other things. If, if you're not familiar with it, I, I, I would encourage you to chase down a copy of it. Uh, seeing that, uh, uh, then Senator uh, Robert Kennedy took a, a tour of uh, Willowbrook, which was one of the institutions that uh, Blatt and Kaplan had toured, and uh, afterwards he uh, he he granted an interview, and uh, uh, you know it's a grainy black and white photo, but uh, even in that you can see that Kennedy was was shocked with what he'd seen. He ashen faced. He says, "I think that particularly at Willowbrook we have a situation that borders on a snake pit." and that chil the children live in filth, that many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of adequate manpower. Um, and there is very little future for those children, for those who are in these institutions. So, um, you know, by the mid 60s, things were, uh, were changing. Parents and family members, importantly, were, were 
were not willing to send their children to the institutions and and wanted different options. So uh, in the in the fifties and sixties, there emerged a, a disability movement. Uh, you know, and many professionals uh, 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 partnered. Uh, with uh, uh, parents and family members to begin to create systems um, uh, that that provided supports in the community, in schools, in the places where uh, people were. Uh, I know, and I'm sure that Doctors Simpson and Ramsey uh, were among that cadre of people, uh, professionals that created something new, something different. I understand Glenwood was established in the, in the same uh, spirit and, and era. Um, so, you know, this is a parent and professional movement, but parents, uh, as it turns out, had a lot of clout with uh, legislators, people like Elizabeth Boggs, who was the parent of a son who had penal ketonuria. Um, I pictured here somebody that anyone under the age of maybe 40 probably doesn't know, but that is uh, uh, Dale Evans Rogers. Uh, she, she was uh, the wife of uh, 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 Roy Rogers. Uh, I think that modern era, uh, you know, folks born uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 who are younger just cannot understand how popular these people were. Um, uh, Roy Rogers would release seven movies a year. When television came around, they had a huge um, uh, uh, television show that was among the first of these variety shows. They, they were recording sensations. I, I won't sing Happy Trails to you. Uh, so you can, uh, uh, you can thank your lucky stars for that. <clears throat> uh, you know, Dale Evans was uh, at, uh, one of the, the most uh, visible women uh, in the United States through, uh, through that period. And it happened that the first uh, biological child born to Dale Evans and Roy Rogers uh, was uh, uh, Robin Elizabeth and Robin Elizabeth Rogers had Down syndrome. And um, so um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Robin lived in a time when uh, surgeries weren't as sophisticated, knowledge wasn't available, and, and she passed away at the age of two from heart conditions that today would be treated upon birth. <clears throat> and Dale Evans Rogers wrote a book called The Angel Unaware that talked about the importance of uh, Robin in their lives and uh, the blessing that Robin had provided. And it was a very different message. Parents had been told that they were the problem, that they caused their children, that they needed to send their children away. And uh, here is Dale Evans Rogers, one of the most visible people in the world, telling parents that uh, uh, that it that they uh, that their children are blessings to them and to the world. Um, and more than just being that visible representation. Um, Dale Evans Rogers donated 100% of the royalties from uh, Angels Unaware the, uh, uh, to uh, what was then a, uh, a, 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 a very early parent movement that funded, in this case, you see her uh, 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 providing a check to what was then called the National Association for Retarded Children. That was now the Ark of the United States for $10,000. That's a lot of money back in 1954. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, her donations helped to, uh, to actually fund uh, the first uh, executive director and national headquarters. Of course, <clears throat> the, um, the parent movement had a, a, an outstanding ally in the form of uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, who, of course, became president in 1960, and also, of course, was the sibling uh, of a sister with intellectual disability. So one of JFK's uh, primary initiatives was to build, begin to build a community-based system 
uh, for people with intellectual disability and for people with mental health related issues. He was pushed all along all the way by, uh, by his sister, um, uh, uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who in the photo uh, is shown uh, receiving uh, a pen from uh, President Kennedy after he signed legislation in October of 1963. In that audience is Gunnar Dibwad toward the right uh, up front and somewhere in there is Elizabeth Boggs as well. Um, and then the photo on the, <clears throat> on the right is um, uh, Kennedy speaking October 24th, 1963, less than a month before he was assassinated uh, at the National uh, head at the National Association's um, uh, annual conference. But they were able to put in place uh, legislation. Those of us who have uh, been involved with USEDS and uh, who have um, uh, uh, worked and, and the community, supported in the community with USEDS, know that the university affiliated facilities was part of that early Kennedy money. So established in many ways, the, the university uh, standards of excellence system. Um, I taught my one of my teaching uh, uh, assignments uh, was in a building that had been constructed on a public school ground with Kennedy funds. So uh, very influential. So, you know, the, the, the parent movement uh, had significant impact. Parents working with parent uh, professionals were able to move things forward. The, the peak census for, the, um, for institutionalization in the United States was 1979. So, you know, it took a while, though. The, 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 and in 1979, in the late 70s, there were about 250,000 Americans with developmental disabilities warehoused in large state-run institutions. Um, now that number is uh, in the neighborhood of 20,000, 15 to 20,000, mainly clustered in a number of large states. These are large state-run institutions. The economics of the system will almost guarantee that by 2030, there will be no large state-run institutions operating anymore. It's too expensive. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are more than half the states uh, have already closed and moved people into community-based systems. So uh, the, the parent movement was critical, important for establishing the right to a free public education. If you're a special educator, as I have been in my career, uh, Public Law 94-142 was, was put in place because of the pressure uh, put on the government and the federal government by parents and family members. Gerald Ford did not want to sign that legislation uh, he felt that it was going to be too expensive, uh, but uh, he really had no choice because parents were pushing that and demanding their legislators that they they needed to have that. And people like Bob Dole and Ted Kennedy uh, on both sides of the aisle were, were uh, also pushing that. The community movement was part of what uh, the 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 outcome of the parent movement, but there were they there weren't all the things that probably should have happened. You know, earlier stereotypes of disability were replaced with more humane, but still in many ways debilitating stereotypes. You know, people were seen as, as uh, uh, needing to be fixed or cured, uh, changed. They were broken uh, still. They were victims of their uh, disabling condition. It was the era of charity and, and you know, uh, unlike previous eras, uh, they were viewed as, as, you know, they were innocents, holy innocents, eternal children, they're worthy of charity, but they're not quite like us. That was the underlying message. You know, the increased emphasis on mental age during this period had us talking about minds of a three-year-old and, you know, anyone who uh, knows something about neural development, knows that that's kind of nonsense. But uh, so what should we have learned? Um, well, first of all, from, from you know, that period, these periods, one, 
when we understand people as different, it soon becomes construed as being inferior, leading to discrimination and maltreatment. If you think that is all in the past, then I encourage you to, to find the book, The Boys in the Bunkhouse by New York Times reporter Dan Barry, published about, I don't know, it's been maybe a decade ago now, uh, <clears throat> or just find the New York Times series that ran about these. These were men in Iowa who were warehoused and uh, basically kidnapped actually from institutions in Texas and Louisiana, brought up to Iowa where they were warehoused in a, in a dilapidated old schoolhouse, 70 men in this, in this schoolhouse, and, and forced to come into a turkey plant and spent their days eviscerating turkeys and doing other very difficult and, and demeaning work for pennies to the dollar. Um, and, and it wasn't until uh, the early 1990s that this uh, was discovered, that it was leaked to the press, and these men were, uh, were uh, you know, their, their situation, their context. I would argue that you cannot treat people the way these men uh, uh, in Iowa were treated if you believe them to be fully human. The treatment and uh, the belief in humanity and dignity are incompatible. So there, you know, I, 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 every time I think we're past some of these atrocities, something else comes up. But, uh, you know, when we understand people as different, we, it leads to discrimination and maltreatment. Secondly, uh, the Olmstead Act uh, uh, says basically unjustified segregation of persons with disabilities constitutes discrimination under the ADA. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think what we understand and, and what I know we're all working toward is that we, that the dignity resides in the community. People who are supported to live full rich lives with others in their communities uh, is the goal and, and the movement. And, you know, we're getting there. Um, uh, at the same time uh, that the height of the, the institutional census, 250,000, there were fewer than 500 people living in community-based settings in the United States. Now that number is well over 600,000. We need to continue to push and to, to go all out to uh, ensure that people have rich, full lives in their community. Um, you know, I go back to Kennedy's statement uh, when I think about what we should have learned from the history. Um, he says this, he, you know, he, he says children are living in snake pit, filth, uh, and, and it's because of three things. He says, one, lack of attention, two, lack of imagination, three, lack of adequate manpower, you know, given the, the now uh, gendered uh, language there. But, you know, two of those things, I think, are things we continue to struggle with. We don't get enough attention from our state legislators to support the kinds of things that we want to do. The federal, uh, the federal legislation is, is great, but it, it fails to really ensure that, that there are resources. So, you know, there's a lack of attention to our cause, to our, our efforts. There are, uh, you know, the, 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 cri the, the largest crisis, I suspect uh, uh, my colleagues at Glenwood would, uh, could talk about this, much more eloquently than I can, but the, the lack of dis, uh, direct support personnel and what, uh, what you know, the system uh, is enabled to pay people is a huge issue. We continue to struggle with that. But that third reason that Kennedy talked about is something that I think you and I need to look deeply and say, is that us? He says, lack of imagination. Um, we suffer from the lack of the imagination to do anything that we haven't already seen done. Um, you know, we, we, we work in systems. I've worked in, in school systems. I, 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 I worked for a year at an institution for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the state of Texas. So I know these systems uh, well, and I, I know that 
to some degree you you have to operate with what you know to be that you know there there's these but but we need to be able to step back and and remove our own biases remove our own uh, uh, thoughts, really, stereotypes about what things can be. Because when we do that, and importantly, I think when we work with people with disability, things can happen and things can change. And I'm sure many of you have seen that in your, your own lives. Uh, we have to have a vision. Um, the former president of Notre Dame said, you can't blow an uncertain trumpet. What he was saying was, We've either got to be all in on this or not. You cannot go out and say, well, maybe if we can, you know, we need to do these things. We need to support real meaningful employment. We need to support, you know, uh, uh, lives and communities. We've got to, uh, to blow a certain trumpet. Uh, you know, I've been in the field since really the 1970s. Um, uh, and so over that long period of time, it's depressing how long that is. I've learned one thing that's true in the uh, in the literature from 1970 to 19 to you know 2022. Um, if you look at the previous decades' uh, literature and and uh, 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 research and ideas, what you learn is that people with disabilities always exceeded the expectations uh, that were that were voiced for them from the previous decade. We have always been wrong about what we believe people with disabilities can achieve. And we are probably wrong now. I don't mean to, to, <laughs> to bash all of us, but again, we need to put aside what we think we know and take a look and say, what can we do to support people? Because if we give people chances, uh, uh, time and time again, they show that they are they are able to go beyond what anyone's expectations. And finally, going back to the CRPD, I have come to believe there have been so many atrocities, so many really you know, horrific things happen to people with disability. But ultimately, I have come to conclude that the injustice committed against people with disabilities throughout time has been denied, to deny them the dignity afforded to persons simply by their status as human beings, their inherent dignity, value, and worth. And that's what we need to be about as we look to the future. You know, I said we need to learn from the past, and I think we do need to learn from the past. If you go to Washington, D.C., there are two statues that uh, 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 border the entrance to the, the, the nation's uh, archives, the National Archives building. Uh, one, uh, uh, which you see on the right here, is an older gentleman uh, with a closed book on his lap, and, and the base of his statue says, study the past. In statuary language, apparently, uh, a closed book is, is the knowledge of the past. There's nothing new being written. Um, on the left side of that entrance is a statue of a woman sitting with an open book in her lap and it says what is past is prologue in statuary language a uh, an open book is now and in the future it's still being written the past is prologue is something that we're familiar with we think about this meaning that uh, uh, we need to know what happened in the past because if not, we're going to repeat the, the sins of the past in the future. And, and that is true, but actually the, the quote is from Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, and it occurs right at the end of act one. And uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm forgetting who the, uh, uh, the character in the play, uh, utters this, but, but what they're saying is, you've just seen act one, uh, but there is more. There is an act two. The past is a prologue to act two. It is, it is still, uh, the future is an open book. The, there is more to come. And that is, that is the good news. It's not just that that we worry about repeating, I don't think we're gonna repeat most of the sins of the past that I've just, but, but we need, to, we need to, to use that to launch into a future uh, that is different 
from that past. And, and so in the 1980s uh, emerged a disability movement in which people with disabilities began to demand their rights to, to, to equal protection, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to their inherent dignity. They were talking about their right uh, as human beings to be valued and to be seen as worthy, independent of anything else. I, I was trying to figure out which, I've had the privilege, particularly in my years with the ARC and on, of working with many, many of the founders of the, self, the national self-advocacy movement, Tia Nellis, um, Nancy Ward, just a, a number of them, but I chose to highlight Betty Williams in this slide. Betty was a, 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 a major player in the national self-advocacy movement. She was head of I Indiana People First for many, many years. Uh, she was as wonderful a human being as ever existed. And, and, and Betty passed away uh, in the past year or two. And so she's just one of so many self-advocates who if, if people listen, have ideas about how they want and deserve to be treated, what they want to do, what their preferences are. So, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, Jean-Paul Bovey said it in the same speech he gave. He says, he says people with, dis with autism, talking about autism, need to, to join the disability rights movement. They need to, uh, they know, uh, these groups know what uh, we face is prejudice and discrimination. We need, fight for our humanity, our rights, our respect and dignity that we deserve from the day we were born. Again, inherent dignity. Uh, Jean-Paul Bovey, this is, you know, this is 22 years ago, uh, Jean-Paul is, is talking. Uh, um, you know, again, these themes of rights and, and respect. There has grown, um, uh, Paul Longmore was among the, the, the influential people in, in developing a positive disability identity and positive disability culture movement, uh, looking at social models of disability where disability is not viewed as a problem within the person, but in fact is uh, uh, the imposition of environments and systems that themselves are not uh, accessible, that uh, deny people opportunities to live self-determined, self-defined lives. So these issues of self-determination uh, are part of the, of, the, of the disability identity movement that says, you know, I, we're proud of our disability. Uh, the Aut uh, Autistic uh, uh, Self-Advocacy Network position statement talks about the social model as, uh, uh, as, as reflecting cultural and societal attitudes, environments, uh, uh, and, and talks. Again, you know, you should be seeing a theme here. Uh, civil rights and dignity of autistics and others with disabilities to create a world in which all people benefit from whatever support services, tools, assistive technologies, and empower them to fully participate with respect and self-determination as the guiding principles. You know, in, in, uh, in, uh, in medicine, in, in psychology, um, uh, there grew in the early 80s an understanding that thinking about uh, disability, particularly in the ways that had, had kind of led up to the 1980s, uh, uh, you know, particularly long-term chronic uh, impairments, was 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 it was not helpful, and so from um, uh, the WHO came the the International Classification of Impairments, Disabilities, and Handicaps in 1980, and then in 2001 the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health. I had the privilege of editing the Oxford Handbook of Positive Psychology and Disability. This was published in 2012, and to be perfectly honest. Had we tried to do this uh, a decade earlier, there would not have been enough uh, content and we didn't have a language to talk about positive aspects of disability and strengths-based approaches. So in a, in a very relatively short period of time, we began to uh, talk about, you know, uh, we talked about 
social ecological models of disability, person environment fit models of disability. And you know, the many of you I know are, are familiar with the ICF and I, I use this, you know, it's important because uh, it's a, the ICF focuses on functioning rather than disability. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ICF uses disability as an umbrella term that, that talks about not only impairments uh, to body structure and function and health conditions, but also environmental factors, the social factors that impact what one can do, uh, as well as personal factors. Uh, and all of those play into activities, activities, uh, uh, daily activities, the things you and I do on a day-to-day -day basis, getting ready in the morning, getting up, going to work, setting, you know, all these things that we do, uh, looking at how the interaction of uh, health conditions and environmental factors and personal factors impact activity, and importantly, how uh, activity impacts a person's participation uh, in, in their own life. Uh, and in many ways, we're moving with the ICF to ways of thinking about disability that really care mostly about this issue of participation. How do uh, uh, restrictions uh, uh, to uh, uh, body structure and function health conditions, how do, how do environments, and, and what personal factors enable people to engage in activities that uh, result in their full participation and inclusion. And, you know, if you go to uh, 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 Article 3 uh, uh, of the CRPD, again, um, uh, it talks about uh, Part C of the general principles is full and effective participation and inclusion in society. Inclusion is good. What we want is we want to enable people to fully participate and participate in ways that they want to participate and not what somebody else wants them. We've talked about participation as a person's self-determined involvement in a pattern of life, their roles, their life situations, their activities, everything that comprise living full rich lives in our society, each of us has different things we love and we like. Many, you know, some of you may be mountain climbers or, you know, uh, uh, run marathons. I like to sit and read books, <laughs> much more sedentary. You know, our, our lives are, are not uh, the same. We, we have the right to pursue uh, participation that reflects what we want. You know, these changing understandings of disability are, are big. They're strengths-based. They are not, uh, they don't begin with deficits. I was, as I said, a, a psychologist, <clears throat> clinical psychologist in an institution in Fort Worth, Texas in the late 1980s. Uh, and even then we had uh, habilitation planning meetings that had a form that we were started, uh, we, we started off by listing what a person's strengths were. So, you know, that wasn't a new idea, this idea of strengths based, but I, I remember very fully uh, one of the units that I supported uh, were, uh, involved young men with very extensive medical and uh, um, uh, medical and, and um, uh, physical and cognitive impairments uh, really required quite a lot of uh, very specialized care. Um, and I had to go over as a psychologist and do the prescribed, you know, uh, uh, IQ test uh, and, you know, for, uh, uh, with a young man and, and it, of course, not ever designed for people like this young man. But one of the things that struck me as I interacted with him, I'd never met him before. He had a wonderful smile. He was engaged. He got me engaged with him because he was so engaged. You know how that worked? He was, he was, he was having a good time with this. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I walked away from there thinking that I liked that young man. He was a good person. We got to that young man's habilitation planning, the case, the caseworker who, I know was overwhelmed with too many things to do. There's never enough money. There's never enough resources. She started off this uh, meeting and said that uh, this young man's uh, strengths, and then there was a pause and I knew things weren't going 
to go well, and she said, uh, is that he has a prepaid burial plan. She wasn't a bad person. Um, she just couldn't see beyond the disability. She couldn't see that this young man had a myriad of strengths that we now understand to be very important. He was engaging. You know, when we can't see beyond the disability, we just perpetuate the same stuff that hasn't worked. So it's strengths-based. We start with what people do well. What are they good at? What do they like to do? Uh, you know, these, these changing understandings of disability, they, they, they are part of and not apart from typical human functioning. Disability becomes just one of the things that people experience, and many of us, if not most of us, will experience disability before, before we exit this planet. So, you know, it's just part of typical human functioning. It's not a part from. You know, these, these things shift our focus on the environment, on the context, on uh, instead of fixing or curing or changing the individual. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the wealth of medical, uh, uh, supports and, and uh, treatments that are out there that are life-changing for people. So I'm talking about kind of almost more about attitudes. How can we, how can, it, you know, when we've gone as far as we can to, to uh, mitigate the effects of the health-related condition, what can we do to change the environment and the context? Uh, and, and, and what can we do about putting in place supports that enable people to, to function successfully. Uh, you know, uh, back in the, the, what now feels like 20 years ago, but was really only two years ago, uh, before the pandemic, I, I traveled a lot. I traveled internationally um, and uh, I would get in countries where I didn't speak the language uh, and I was supposed to get from the hotel to some environment and I was able to use my, my Google Maps uh, to get me there, and I could use Google Translate in places like China, to where I had no clue what the the symbols mean. We all get by with supports, and 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 supports are a critical element now. What can we do uh, uh, to enhance the possibility? And there's, of course, as I've said, a full focus on participation. Um, you know, supports are resources and strategies that promote the interest and causes of people with or without disabilities. Uh, enable them to access opportunities, relationships, work, school, living environments, and result really uh, in, in greater interdependence, productivity, community inclusion, life satisfaction, and human functioning. We, you know, we, we have an array of supports beginning with the person themselves. That's, that's the, the gist of my work over the years. We need to enable people to, to be self-determined so that they can live self-determined lives. And then there are families and friends and, and, and non-paid supports, coworkers, uh, uh, generic services in the community. And, and then finally, the types of specialized supports that uh, kind of cap it off. But if we start up there with the specialized supports, we're not gonna get where we wanna go. There's, there are never enough people, there's never enough money. We have, to, we have to begin with the person and their family and to the community and to what uh, sources exist in the community. You know, these, the implications, these lead us to strengths-based approaches that focus on community inclusion, that empower and enable people with disability to live full, rich lives, a focus on full citizenship and participation, and a focus on self-determination. You know, I'm gonna close with a, a few words about issues of self-determination. Um, um, I, I, I refer to another uh, United Nations uh, Declaration of Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In Article Two says that everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in the, the, the Declaration without distinction of any kind. Uh, and uh, goes on to say, we, we, we may then define freedom. What is freedom? We, we talk a lot about freedom in our, in our society, but in this case, freedom is the range of effective choices open to an actor, a person, such as an individual or a group of person. The choices of actions or policy open to a group 
eventually can be translated by virtue of their consequences into indirect choices for individuals. Really what it's saying is that uh, in this universal declaration of rights, uh, 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 human rights, self-determination, the rights to, to act, uh, to make choices, um, and, and to pursue full participation are basic elements of basic human rights. This issue of self-determination emerged uh, in, the, in the disability movement early on, um, uh, uh, 1972, uh, in a book that was uh, uh, edited by Wolf Wolfensperger, who I, I talked about. The book is titled Normalization. Um, you know, uh, particularly those of you who are trainees, uh, go back and find normalization. Read about what people in the early 70s were talking about because it took another 20 years before anyone paid any attention to that. It took a long time. Bent Nurje, uh, uh, a Swedish uh, a philosopher, wrote a chapter in this titled The Right to Self-Determination. He's, he's, he was writing about his experiences basically as an advisor and a support for self-advocacy uh, uh, folks in a self-advocacy movement, people with intellectual disability in Sweden at the time who were advocating to be able to move out of institutions. And he wrote this in this chapter. He said, one major facet of the normalization principle is to create conditions through which a disabled person experiences the normal respect to which any human being is entitled, inherent dignity. Thus, the choices, wishes, desires, and aspirations of a disabled person have to be taken into consideration as much as possible in actions affecting him. To assert oneself with one's family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, other people, or vis-a-vis -vis an agency is difficult for many persons. It is especially difficult for someone who has a disability or is otherwise perceived as devalued. But in the end, the impaired person has to manage as a, as a distinct individual and thus has his identity defined to himself and to others through the circumstances and conditions of his existence. Thus, the road to self-determination is indeed both difficult and all important for people uh, who are impaired. Uh, Nurye was, was decades ahead of the field. Uh, I had the, the, uh, the privilege of meeting Ben Nurye in 2003 uh, and talking with him. Uh, he passed away shortly thereafter. Um, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Ben Nurye's shoulders are, are, are what I've stood on. And, and his work then uh, taught me a lot about what self-determination might mean. First of all, you know, in his chapter, Nurye clearly articulates the importance of this personal self-determination to all people, not excluding people with intellectual and developmental and neurodevelopmental disabilities. This is the inherent dignity part again. Uh, all people uh, 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 deserve the right to, to live self-determined lives. He equates self-determination with the respect and the dignity to which all people are entitled. Self-advocates have echoed that and said that time and time again. Uh, Bob Williams, who's been a pioneer in the disability movement, a man with cerebral palsy, who's been a, a leader at the federal level, including uh, at one point commissioner of the Administration on Developmental Disabilities, talked about self-determination, said we as people with disability don't need to be told what self-determination means. We already know what it means. It means uh, the right to live full, rich lives to pursue the American dream, to lives of respect and dignity. Um, you know, Nurye's chapter uh, 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 talked about the fact that people define themselves and other people define them by the circumstances and conditions of their lives. Think about what that means. I was a, a public school teacher in uh, 19, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, not, yeah, 1985. Uh, and uh, I was teaching students to sort uh, 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 by, by shape, color, size in preparing them to get on waiting lists to get into the, the institution or something. Uh, and and um, I went to a, a, a session uh, done by Paul Wayman, uh, 
about uh, this thing called supported employment. Uh, and immediately I understood that I needed to do something different because when one of the values of uh, and the important uh, the importance of, of supported employment, customized employment, uh, self-employment, all of those is that other people see people being functioning uh, in society, uh, in doing uh, societally valued roles. And it changes how people think about that person. People define themselves by the circumstances and conditions of their lives. Other people uh, uh, define people and people define themselves, you know, and, and, and too many Americans have been taught that they uh, are no better than, than the conditions of their lives. Um, and, you know, finally, uh, Nuria talks about the importance, the recognition that self-determination is a fundamental in attaining the respect and, and dignity and perceiving uh, one's, uh, oneself as valued and, and worthy, which is why people with disabilities have been instrumental in, in the clarion call for self-determination. You know, if you go to the dictionary, you basically get two, uh, two definitions of self-determination. Uh, one uh, refers to one's own actions, so the, the, the free choice of one's own actions or states without external compulsion, doing something without somebody else forcing you to do it. And then there's this uh, kind of national or, or, or group self-determination, uh, the, the rights of people to self-governance uh, fundamentally. Um, uh, when, when I talk about autonomy, we, you know, autonomy is a term that we use a lot. And I, I, what I think, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, mostly people think about it meaning doing things for yourself. Uh, the John Wayne theory of autonomy, You're, you pull up your boots and you go do it yourself. And of course, if, if you use a wheelchair uh, and can't reach the inaccessible cabinet in the, in the inaccessible kitchen, you can't uh, do uh, something yourself by by no virtue of your own fault it's because of the lack of accessibility and autonomy this is autonomy is independence and it's important uh, and in in adolescent psychology which my my doctorate is in developmental psychology with a focus on on adolescence so much of my work has been with adolescents um, you know the degree to which uh, adolescents are self-reliant they make decisions for themselves uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when I think the, the CRPD and the Convention uh, uh, for Human Rights and, and uh, Bent Nurier talk about autonomy, it's not as independence. We can put in place supports and design environments so that people can, can be as independent as anyone else. It's about in, autonomy as volition, the degree to which, in this case, adolescents, but all people, regulate their behavior based upon deeply held values, preferences, and interests. The, the, you know, if you think about it, as adults in our society, we don't, uh, we don't do something in general that, uh, that we don't want to do. I mean, you know, okay. Uh, yes, there are things that we don't want to do in our day-to-day -day work. We have to go to meetings. We have to sit through, you know, lectures. Uh, but uh, we're doing that because we have a, 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 a value to that to us. It, it, it's it's what we need to do to to achieve the goals and and do the things that we want to do. And that's where autonomy is really important. We need to support people to enable them to pursue uh, lives that recognize uh, their own values, their own preferences, their own interests. And of course, every person with a disability has as wide a differences in their interests, preferences, and, and, and values as everyone else, as everyone in this audience is. So, um, you know, when we talk about self-determination and when self-advocates talk about self-determination, it's often within that second uh, 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 context, but it, it's, it's usually mixes the two sort of definitions. So uh, within the disability rights movement and, and the advocacy movement, uh, self-determination uh, uh, reflects an empowerment and a rights-based orientation typically associated with 
the sense of the term as referring to independence and self-governance uh, as autonomy, uh, as independence. Empowerment, you know, is a term associated with social movements and the struggle for marginalized people for equal rights. We are at uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, the sit-in in, in uh, um, uh, in San Francisco, led by people like Judy Human. If you if you haven't seen uh, the the documentary Crip Camp, you must watch this. It's uh, it was streaming. I think it still is streaming on on uh, on Netflix. Uh, it was this movement toward uh, empowerment, toward self governance, toward self determination. Referred both to the desire of people with disabilities to set their own goals, to, to live lives that reflect their own personal interests, preferences, and values, as well as, as a group, to have the right to self-governance. Self-determination uh, comes out of uh, uh, late uh, 16th century uh, philosophy. I have a whole slew of slides on that, so you've been spared that part of the lecture. Um, but it, 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 it's from the, the doctrine of determinism that, that, that suggests that all actions are caused in some way, shape, or form by events that are laws that precede or are antecedent to. And, and that includes human behavior. So, so what self-determinism uh, means is that um, uh, 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 people cause themselves to act in certain ways as opposed to causing uh, uh, to someone else or something else causing us to act in certain ways. It's about people making things happen in their own lives. Uh, and, and people who are self-determined are people who embody this characteristic quality of self-determination. They are making things happen in their lives. And, and that's an important, uh, an important distinction. They're making things happen. It's not the same as acting independently. I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, as opposed to somebody else causing us. So we've defined self-determination as and self-determined behavior as uh, volitional action that enable one to act as the primary causal agent in one's own life and to maintain or improve one's quality of life. That's what we're doing. We're acting in ways that improve, enhance the quality of our lives by pursuing the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, uh, causal agency it means to make or cause things to happen in one's life. Volitional action means making a conscious choice or decision. I'm nearly to the end. I want to just point out self-determination is not about being in control. It's about making things happen. Often it, that's uh, uh, utilizing somebody else to get what you want. I, my taxes are prepared by a tax accountant because uh, A, I, I, uh, I prefer that and B, it's probably safer for me to, to, to do that. Uh, Self-determination is not just doing things yourself. It's about making something happen in your life. Uh, and it's not just making a choice. Making choices are important, but it's about making things happen in your life, about being involved in every decision, in every goal, uh, and having those reflect your preferences and your interests. And, you know, I think we sometimes create programs that, that take on meanings beyond. It's not just about involving people in their own planning. It's about a planning that, that actually embraces uh, people's uh, views. Um, you know, technology is going to be a huge thing in the future. We already, you know, if you can't read well, we've got digital talking books. I, you know, I, I've gotten to where I listen to as many books uh, through um, audible.com as I do uh, uh, read books, uh, uh, um, you know, when I'm driving and, and such. We all know what smartphones, iPads, tablet PCs have done. I don't know what the next big innovative uh, uh, transformative technology is, but it will it will come. You know, cloud-based apps are making everything, moving everything into the cloud. Right now, you know, if you have a customization on your your laptop or your your uh, your PC, uh, if you're not at that PC, you can't you can't access the things that you need to be accessible. More and more, those are moving up into the cloud. So if you need text to speech, you can access it from any uh, any uh, computer 
or, or device uh, and it will access um, uh, your, your, your individualized, personalized supports from the cloud. Uh, 3D printing, you know, I, I, I know that about a year ago, uh, a, a company in, in uh, Britain started selling 3D printed wheelchairs that were still customizable, fit to the person, but uh, could be uh, uh, printed in half the time and half the cost. I, I, you know, we're heading to a point where people will be able to manufacture their own uh, supports in that way. The internet of everything or the internet of things, you know, uh, by 2025, there's supposed to be 20 billion objects uh, uh, connected on, on the internet, you know, our, our our cell phone, our, our smartphones, iPads, our tablets, but more and more, if you if you bought a a, 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 a microwave lately, it's a computer that can, can access a Wi-Fi. Your car has become a computer that can access. You know, we're heading to a future, I believe, and I'm not going to say much more about it. I believe that what we can't do won't matter. What will matter is the forts we have in place to do what we want to do. And we need to be at the cutting edge to figure out what those supports look like for people with disabilities. Let me close with a story. Um, I've worked at the Beach Center on Disability for uh, 20 years now, uh, actually 20, 22 years. Uh, and uh, the Beach Center was found by, founded by Ann and Rudd Turnbull, who were uh, pioneers in the family movement. Uh, Ann is uh, the proud holder of her doctorate from the University of Alabama. So uh, she's a, a Alabamian. Um, uh, and their son, Jay, who is in the picture of a, a much younger me here, <laughs> uh, uh, it, uh, had multiple disabilities. Uh, you know, he had a myriad of labels, but Jay also had uh, uh, so many strengths. Uh, the 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 uh, that uh, you know he he everyone in town knew Jay. They all knew, you know, if they saw Jay coming, they would support him in ways. He lived a full, rich life in his community. And he taught many of us how, if we step back from what we expect and we listen, that we can design supports to enable people like Jay to live full, rich lives. Uh, Jay passed away now over a decade ago, um, unexpectedly. And the Turnbulls asked me to do a eulogy at Jay's um, at Jay's, Jay's funeral. Uh, I, I've done a lot of talks over the years. Uh, and this was far and away the hardest I've ever had to do. And as I thought about what I was going to say, what could I say? Uh, I was clicking through the, the university's website the night before, and, and there they had a, a, uh, an obituary that they ran, uh, you know, just an in memoriam for Jay. And the headline of the was longtime employee passes away, or longtime employee Jay Turnbull passes away. And that struck me because I thought, you know, um, Ann and Rudd were distinguished professors. That could have, that in headline would have read in many places, son of distinguished professors uh, passed away. Um, and and um, uh, you know you know but but it, that headline and the story recognized Jay's dignity as being an employee of the University of Kansas and his contributions. And so I closed my eulogy with the observation that you know Jay taught us about the dignity of everyday life. Of, of Jay loved to celebrate holidays. Uh, and he taught us that we need to take each day and celebrate it for what it was. So many other things, you know, the, he taught me more about the dignity of everyday life and of every person than any textbook uh, I could have ever read. And I realized and I, I commented that, you know, we all talk about ourselves being in the in the, you know, in the education business or the rehabilitation business or, you know, this business or that business associated with disability. I'm going to suggest that what Jay taught me is we are all in the dignity business and that is our business 
to to recognize and to enhance uh, the uh, the dignity, the inherent dignity of every human being and of every person that we uh, uh, support. Sarah, did you happen to look at some, uh, you could toss me some of the questions that might be out there? Yeah, so um, thank you so much for that um, amazing presentation. I've been getting lots of feedback from folks as they're listening to you and I'm so grateful for your time and your experience and knowledge and your insights and bringing that all together for us. Um, and we're so glad that it's being recorded um, because that is a, a message that uh, we look forward to sharing. Um, I'm actually going to ask Julie McDougall to help um, moderate the discussion. And um, I know there's been some great information shared in the chat as you've been talking, uh, but want to invite everybody now if you have questions or other things um, that you would like our speaker to comment on, type that in the chat and Julie will help um, monitor and, and kind of moderate that. Well, I, I, while that's happening, I see that Alan Bergman uh, uh, pointed out very rightly that uh, uh, Bob Persky's work in, in the same uh, book that Nuria has appeared on the dignity of risk, uh, 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 it was something that was uh, really transcendental to uh, to how we do what we do. Um, I see a number of resources. Uh, Susan Ellis points out that uh, Rudd wrote a, a book called The Exceptional Life of Jay Turnbull that is out there. Um, work uh, on the Center on Self-Determination is out there. There are lots of, of sources. I didn't spend a lot of time, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, and, and um, I'm, you know, Susan mentions that the presentation is going to be a part of People First programming. I, I, that is such an honor and such a privilege. I, I, you know, the, uh, the, the I have the had the privilege of being the spokesperson in many ways, but the the people that make this happen are people with personal experience with disability. And the People First movement has made a huge a huge uh, impact and will continue. So I'm easily reached uh, via my email, which is just easier to Google. So uh, if anything I said, or if you wanted, if you want additional resources or anything I can do to support what you're doing, please don't hesitate. And again, I I, I want to thank uh, uh, Ken and the and the and the, and the folks uh, at Glenwood for the privilege of giving the Glenwood endowed and, and, and the folks at UAB for all you do and uh, for allowing me to, to come. And I hope next year you, you have the opportunity to do this in person. I, I did look at the list of previous uh, Glenwood endowed speakers. I know many of them. I have a great admiration for many of them. So uh, it's a privilege. We do have one question that was put in the chat box, although we only have a minute left, so I don't know how well you'll be able to answer this, but it is, how do we bridge the gap between the policies and words and everyday practice? Yeah, and it is the universal uh, universal quandary, isn't it, uh, Alan? Um, you know, I think, you know, we leverage parents and family members, and most importantly, we leverage, uh, not we leverage, we, we partner with people with disability to go and to talk to people. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I have become discouraged about, uh, you know, we've taken an incremental, uh, incremental approach to uh, change, uh, you know, and change has happened, but, uh, you know, uh, during the COVID pandemic, it was people with disabilities uh, were uh, tenfold more likely to die because of the, the circumstances of their lives. We have got to abandon incrementalism and we have got to adopt policies that say, we're going to do this. And we have got to, we have got to, we got to form allies. We, you know, we have allies in the, at the federal level, uh, but not the kinds of allies we used to have in Ted Kennedy and, and Bob Dole and, and uh, Tom Harkin and many others. We've got to have, those allies, we've got to make disability a, a nonpartisan uh, uh, topic again, so, uh, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, I think that's what, you know, uh, many of us, including Alan, have been doing for the life, but, you know, I, we just, it, we've got to, 
we've got to take the horrific circumstances. I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. One of the people that was early died in, uh, in uh, because of COVID was uh, a man, I'm blanking on his name, uh, but he, uh, he was one of these men that had lived most of his life in this bunkhouse in Iowa. Uh, he was finally freed. He was brought back to Texas and Texas put him in a nursing home because they didn't have uh, community supports that would enable him. It wasn't that he couldn't have lived in the community. It's that they didn't have the system. They didn't have the supports. Nursing homes were hit hard and he passed away. We, we, we have to take our lessons, you know, uh, from, from this and, and, and say no more. So. Thank you so much um, for, for answering that question and really expanding on um, those thoughts as, as well and, and kicking off today's symposium was such an informative um, topic. And, and like I said, you've got us all thinking very deeply.